Nicole Noonan and Jim Lebrecht are the directors of the documentary Crip Camp, which is currently streaming on Netflix, which showcases a summer camp for handicapped teenagers uh, in the 1960s and how the camp's alumni helped lead the fight for civil rights for the disabled. Uh, Nicole, I wanted to start with you. Uh, how much footage did you go through in assembling the film and how were you able to get all of that amazing home video footage that's used in the film? Well, you know, that's sort of, um... The, f the footage was something that Jim remembered. You know, this was this idea of making a film about the summer camp that, that Jim went to was an idea that he shared with me. Um, Jim has been my longtime uh, sound mixer and sound designer on my previous documentaries. And he came to me and said, you know, I've always wanted to see a film made about my summer camp. And, um, and Jim and I had had a fantastic creative collaboration over the years. And so I said, you know, I think that, that this story of how this hippie camp connects to the disability rights movement that came later is an extraordinary story, but I really think what's special is your perspective, Jim, you know, and uh, and asked Jim if he would co-direct it with me. And at that point in time, we were actually, we had still photographs of the camp that Jim had shared with me, and we didn't have any film footage of it. And we were thinking of possibly recreating scenes at the camp with young actors with disabilities, et cetera. And then Jim said, though I do remember that this hippie video coalition, you know, came and visited the camp at one point and filmed the, the camp when it was in the um, throes of a crabs outbreak. <laughs> and he said, I think they gave me a camera. It was an old porta pack He said, I remember they put the deck on the back of my wheelchair and they handed me the camera. And I was like, are you serious, you know? So I just spent months trying to hunt down this footage. And Jim had remembered that the group had, was called the People's Something. And finally, I found a little ad in the back of an old digitized magazine, like a videographer's magazine from the 70s, that said, um, a crabs outbreak at Camp Jeanette for the handicapped by the People's Video Theater. And then was able to track down the, the, the surviving, you know, folks from that group and they, we're so moved that here 50 years later, you know, this basically kid that they had filmed with at a, at a summer camp in the Catskills was coming back and saying, can we use that footage? And lo and behold, they had six hours of that footage that they hadn't really seen since they shot it and that they were in the middle of transferring. Somehow it survived, you know, 17 moves and all of these uh, basements that it had been stored in. And so Jim and I combined that footage with, um, scraps of archival from throughout the disability rights movement that took us about three years actually to collect. And there was hours and hours and hours of that. And uh, Jim, I was actually curious um, as to whether or not, because you know, when you just look at the title, you think it's just gonna be about the summer camp, but then it turns into something uh, completely uh, or, or a bit grander with uh, covering the idea of how this camp helped, you know, bring people to activism. And I was curious, was that always uh, the pivot that you wanted to make with this uh, in terms of making this? Or uh, was that something that you discovered along the way? No, very, very early on, uh, when Nicole and I first started talking, I said, I, I think there's a really good connection here to the disability rights movement. And, and in fact, the, really the first person we called together was Judy Human, who uh, uh, is, you know, one of, uh, I'm going to call her the, one of the stars of this film and of our movement. And Judy said, absolutely. That the discussions we would have, especially in the girls bunk, because us guys were, Lord knows what we were talking about, but in the girls bunks, they were <laughs> talking about, you know, um, you know, gee, you know, our lives could be better and look at these other liberation movements and why not us. But, um, but really, actually, I make a joke about this, but really, for me, meeting Judy Human at that camp and and even her in her early 20s, like, changed my life. Just as someone who was starting, who could think about disability and the fact we could fight back and that I wanted to be an activist for, for people with disabilities, including myself. And uh, Nicole, I'm curious, how did the, um, you said that uh, Jim is someone who you've worked with for a while as a, a sound editor. Uh, how did uh, that relationship, uh, that professional relationship come about? Well, Jim uh, had been uh, a sound designer at the Berkeley Repertory Theater, and then he started his own company at the Fantasy Building in Berkeley. 
And I um, was working on a film called Sentenced Home, which followed uh, three young Cambodian American men um, who were follow who, who were eligible suddenly after 9-11 to be deported back to Cambodia. And we needed a sound mixer. And somebody said, you should really try this guy, Jim Lebrecht. He just opened up a company. And I think you were actually still setting up the technology, really, when, we, when I came in there. Um, and um, my co-director on that film, David Grabius, and I just had a fantastic time working with Jim. Um, we really bonded with him. And so I brought back a couple of other projects um, to Jim over the years. And as time went by, Jim really became for me kind of a portal into understanding disability in a completely different way. You know, through Jim, I came to understand disability as a culture, as a, as a disability, as a community, you know. Um, and I came to see that too many of us see disability through kind of a charity model when we should be thinking of it in a civil rights model. And, um, and it was just also exciting. Like Jim was always playing for me, like here's this disabled rapper, here's this disabled artist, you know? Um, and so when this film opportunity came up and Jim approached me about working on something together, I, I wanted other people to be able to have that same kind of um, shift in perspective that I had had, and 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 film is you know such a beautiful format for doing that. And uh, Jim, uh, you know, it's interesting how we in the uh, the progression that we see in the movie from uh, the passage of the Rehabilitation Act in the early seventies to the actual enforcement of Section five hundred four uh, to the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which uh, can sometimes is sometimes still used. It feels like a punching bag sometimes by some people in politics. Um, even with the incoming government, what are some of the threats that the ADA faces in the immediate future? Well, I mean, enforce, you know, <laughs> enforcement of the law is still a big issue. And there's been pushback basically saying, okay, well, if you have a complaint, then uh, the people have got six months to rectify the issue. What other civil right uh, law has a, 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 a statement basically saying, well, if you've, you know, you've got six months to kind of rectify things. These regulations and laws have been on the books for over 30 years. And businesses, let's say, who are not complying, A, are not fair to the ones that did, and B, have been just trying to skirt the law. So, I mean, th that's one of the smaller things, but in general, for people with disabilities, you know, there are still, um, you know, there are attacks all the time on um, important programs that allow us to live um, outside of our bedrooms, you know, attacks on Medicare or Medicaid. And, uh, and let's not even start talking about what's been going on with COVID and the threat of, uh, of really rationing health care, where people are trying to make determinations based on quality of life. And the last people that really should be making that determination are doctors who look upon people with disabilities often as uh, less than, and gee, we can't do anything for you, and not seeing the beautiful lives that we have. Uh, and uh, Nicole, I was curious as to um, uh, what uh, about uh, what's interesting also about the way this documentary is filmed, especially with the um, uh, the section that focuses on the uh, the uh, uh, occupation of the government building in San Francisco uh, mm -hmm. was the intersection of all these different uh, liber of, of I, I want, I'll say liberation movements. Uh, yeah. You know, with like the Black Panthers and the Gay Liberation Movement uh, in San Francisco. Uh, uh, was that something that was um, expected when you were uh, going through the research of this? You know, it was something that we um, we always liked. We knew we knew about that, and it was something that we wanted to highlight. Um, from the beginning, but it, or as we delved into the research and as we started talking to people, and as, as especially we started talking to people who um, who crossed over those those identity groups, you know, so people like Corbett O'Toole, who's in the film, who's a member of the queer community, and Dennis Phillips, who's an African American, you know, guy who was in the building, um, and we started really. Um, understanding the kind of depth of that story, and we started to see it as kind of you know, this um, beautiful way to kind of talk about 
um, cross-movement solidarity and intersectionality in a time when that is really, really important to other, you know, large social justice movements that are taking place around the world today. Um, and it just seemed like this incredible thing happened there, you know, in 1977 that, um, that hasn't really happened since in terms of so many people collaborating, but also like from a narrative point of view, I mean, literally that sit-in would not have been successful if the Black Panthers hadn't provided three meals a day to the to the um, demonstrators, you know? Um, they literally made it possible. And so um, we ended up kind of almost uh, feeling at the end of the day, like it was kind of like a scene in a superhero movie, you know, where like the, the, the big super <laughs> superheroes sort of arrive on scene and, and save the day. And in, indeed, you know, before the pandemic, we had a couple of opportunities to screen at the in large theaters and people were like jumping to their feet and, and applauding like that um, as these various groups came in. But we also just, you know, we found a lot of really great documentary evidence that that proved that like the um, the disabled community was showing up for those groups in advance. You know, we found some of the kids from Camp Jeanette were, you know, were there, um, you know, at the Pride Parade a few months beforehand. So that idea of kind of like, I've got your back, you've got my back, seemed like such a powerful one for this moment that we're in today. Well, Nicole and Jim, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best during this award season. Thanks for joining us on this panel.